to the computer, share screen, get started. So we'll start with mycoplasma. We did, we did have this in immunology, right? Mentioned mycoplasma in immunology. Do you remember what we associated it with in immunology? Immunology, in back row, you were in immunology because you didn't have to take it from me, so you're already up on immunology. What is mycoplasma associated with? We have this infection. What could this do to our immuno immunology knowledge? Mainly blood bank. I know you haven't got the blood bank yet, but what is it? Zoom? I think of mycoplasma pneumonia. I don't know. Yeah, but what does it cause our immune system to, especially when it comes to blood banking, what does it do? Create what? antibodies? Mm. Um. Not really an antibody. We'll get to it. All right, gosh. So quickly y'all forget. Mycoplasma, urea plasma, smallest organism capable of self reproduction. So um, these are very, very small. If we think about it compared to E. coli, E. coli is at least two to three times larger than mycoplasma. So it kind of gives you an idea. So we have mycoplasma. Matasia, or plasmodia, Asia. We'll go with mycoplasma, ure urea plasma. So these are so small that if we tried to filter them, if we tried to put a bacterial filter, um, they would make it through. So they're smaller than our, our normal bacteria. They're bacteria, but they're smaller than the rest. They require sterols for growth on the media. So we have to supplement that with horse serum because they contain cholesterol or add the cholesterol, the sterol is required and there are no cell wall with mycoplasma. So if they're susceptible to most of our antibiotics that we're gonna talk about in the next week, except those that the mode of action, and you may or may not know this yet, there's the antimicrobials that attack the cell wall of the organism and kill it that way. So these would not be susceptible to that. So the, those class of antibiotics that we're going to get to would not be effective against mycoplasma. So here is to answer Lauren, yes, it's mycoplasma pneumonia, is associated with respiratory tract infections. So we see that and we associate that with what's known as walking pneumonia. Does that ring a bell from immunology? Walking pneumonia. Still nothing from immunology. Okay, there's also uh, hominis and urolyticum, and they're associated with uro urogenital tract infections. And these may be transmitted to newborns. So think about a urogenital tract, having babies, and then newborns are infected as they come through the birth canal. So how would we go about collecting our specimens? With, for mycoplasma pneumonia, we use a nasal pharyngeal swab or oral pharyngeal. Sputum, great, right? That's one of the ones we'll get uh, sent down from respiratory for us. We also do tracheal aspirates. Uh, the patient may carry an organism in the nasal pharyngeal for up to three months after infection. So they become this carrier case. like, And that's what we talked about. I don't know if, I think we talked about this in staph aureus when we decided to check all the healthcare workers in the lab and say, you know, are we the reason that we could be carrying this staph aureus in our nasal passages? And we did, because we, we plated it out and saw it. Um, hominis, we use throat swabs, blood and urogenital specimens. And urolyticum, we use urogenital swabs, urine and fetal membranes or tissue. So once we got the specimen for mycoplasma, we incubated it normal, 36 degrees Celsius for three weeks. Okay, so definitely not one that we're just gonna wait on. Uh, oh yeah, tomorrow we should know if you have a mycoplasma pneumonia infection. 
We're not able to do that. Individual organisms are too small to be seen con with convenient conventional light microscope. And they do not stain well, and hopefully you've made that association with no cell wall. Gram stains aren't going to work very well, right? Because that's where gram, the crystal violet, stains the cell wall. Um, so we use something known as, we're going to go with dinus. We're going to go with dinus, dinus stain, dinus stain. Must be used, and it does stain them blue. So we see dinette stain is used for mycoplasma. So we have some morphology, and some of this is familiar, right? We've seen this type of morphology before, especially with hominids. When we think of the fried egg appearance, pneumonia is granular, and urolytica is granular. And they're the same size here, except for urolytica is very, very small. So here's hominis with the fried egg look. And y'all assured me y'all knew what a fried egg was, right? We talked about it before. Here is your lyticum, very small, granular. So it's again, your lyticum. So if we can't wait the three weeks, right? How else could we test for mycoplasma pneumonia infection? And this is where we were trying to get to with what? With our question about immunology and cold agglutins, and y'all didn't come up with that. Very disappointing, especially with the 94 average on the micro exam. Okay, y'all need to reassure me that that's, that's true average, that that's the S. You're getting this information. Because one of the things that you would get feedback from time to time, and it's kind of disheartening a lot. When we get feedback from students, graduates of the program, and I'm kind of hanging around some now, is that, yeah, but you know, didn't really learn anything in that class. That's always disheartening to hear, all right? And the, I don't know if y'all understand how that comes across, but it, it's disheartening. So if you made an A, yay, all right? But what we're doing, hopefully, is getting you ready for a board exam with, with the A. Uh, I like the A's and I like the B's, right? We always want to make A's and B's. We don't want C's. We definitely can't have D's. So we want to push you to that. But it's very disheartening for a professor to hear, yeah, but didn't really feel like I got anything from that class. I was able to make an A in that class, but really didn't really have to remember anything. So hopefully we're, we're doing a little better than that. So we're, that's a, we did, eww, right? That's, all right, anyway. So when I say cold agglutins, remember back to immunology, not to get too far off track. Go to immunology, cold agglutins. This is when we take the serum out of the body and it agglutinates with our blood bank, right? And we put it with cells, it just agglutinates. And we're like, ah, is that really an AB patient, AB positive patient? that reverse types as O because it's agglutinating in that tube too. And I know y'all hadn't had blood bank yet, but I'm kind of giving you a scenario that's coming next semester. So we need to, to, need to key in on that. We got reactions we weren't expecting. That's what a cold, cold agglutin is. So the scary part is if we went ahead and gave that blood to the patient, they may have some problems, right? or they may not, because if it's an antibody causing it, it would have problems. If it's cold to gluten, we just want to make sure that we prepare for that. And how do we prepare? We warm it up, okay? We don't transfuse room temp. We want to warm it up a little more than that. So we'd actually warm the products and give it to the patient warm. So if it gets back up to body temp as it's being given, then it wouldn't be agglutinating and it won't be causing any problems. And you're really like, you have no idea what that means yet, right? So just remember, mycoplasma pneumonia infection, past infection could lead the patient to have formed a cold agglutin. How does that happen? Okay, combine patient serum with human blood group O, incubate overnight at four degrees Celsius, okay, and that's refrigeration, IgM antibodies against the mycoplasma pneumonia cross-react 
with an antigen on the group O red blood cells causing agglutination. The agglutination disappears if you heat back up to 37, which is our incubation, our incubator, and our body temperature. Okay, so that's the key. So remember, I told you it would impress Dr. Walls if you had that story ready to roll. And it didn't sound like y'all had it ready to roll like a week after I told you the story. So we have to tell it again. And then I'm really worried about next semester because it's going to be weeks before you have to remember this story again about cold gluten and mycoplasma pneumonia. And I've already told her, I think somebody overheard me tell her that she could expect you guys to answer that. I've already put out the challenge by letting her know y'all should be up on this when you come back next semester. Y'all love me when I do that, right? I hope so. All right. We can uh, talk about complement fixation tests. We can do that too with mycoplasma pneumonia. But that would be a quick test to see if you had a prior infection, right? If you had the IgM antibody to mycoplasma pneumonia. So I love these. Mr. Payne left us with several uh, historical pictures, okay? So here we are uh, working in the lab. That would, that would that'd be a good look, I think, for everybody there. Uh, we have our, our um, all sitting around one little table and no gloves and we're finger pipetting like uh, uh, Dr. Folsom wants you to do in chemistry next semester. Wants you to put that finger on top of that pipette. She told me she wasn't budging from that. So I told her y'all were ready with the wheels that I introduced to you, but she's just not going to bring those out. So you might have to go hunting. Here's common fixation test. Awesome historical picture there. Everybody's excited to see complement fixation. All right, so what's the clinical significance of mycoplasma pneumonia? The major cause of primary atypical pneumonia, walking pneumonia, okay? So you'll have it associated with that. So this is not, you know, oh my gosh, we're gonna end up in the hospital bed with this. This is gonna be at home, uh, transmitted by respiratory droplets. Our hominis and urolyticum are, they colonize your genital tract, so they cause problems down there with non gonococcal ure urethitis and pelvic inflammatory PID. So we see that with hominis. Urolyticum, non gonococcal ure urethitis. Hominis and ure urolyticum also cause also cause pneumonia, meningitis, and bacteremia in newborns. So that would make sense if a newborn comes through the birth canal and maybe or maybe not knows to hold their breath, right? They may be breathing coming through the birth canal and they may inhale this mycoplasma hominis and urolyticum that's present in the urogenital tract. All right, any questions on mycoplasma? I think you can answer Dr. Wallace's question in the spring when she gets there. Can you remember antigen I? That would be, that, that would even, that, 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 that might make her day if you could say, oh yes, and it is the I antigen on the red blood cell that is being attacked by the antibody that causes cold gluten outside the body. Anybody had blood bank yet? Yes. Yes. All right. So you should really be answering my questions. Hey, Mr. Rector. Now it took me a second, but then I remembered. Okay. Right. <laughs> I didn't know I had blood bankers in here already. Y'all been kind of hiding from me. Oh, now that I know, I saw two hands in the class go up too. All right. But now we're done with it. So anyway, chlamydiaca family, chlamydia. Remember we talked about gonorrhea before and we talked about, hey, you know, it may do this DNA probe test where you take a swab and send it off for GC, all right? One of those, one of those initials was G for gonorrhea and the other was C for chlamydia. Okay, so coming into the chlamydiaceae family here. These are bacteria, just like gonorrhea is bacteria. So is chlamydia, so bacteria but it, it exists as an obligate intracellular parasite. Keep that or write that down, right? Keep note of that. 
it cannot reproduce outside the host cell. So it's got to have a host cell for life. Okay, but it is a bacteria. There's two genuses. We have family Chlamydiaceae. We have Chlamydia and Chlamydiophila. And the one that you may have heard the most about is Chlamydia trachomatis. That is the one that we hear a lot about. That's the one we usually search after and try to detect. Chlamydiophilia has a, a weird one, right? Who is going to help me with this one? Chlamydiophilia. You want to go? Kate, you're going to go for it. Anybody else want to try? Mary? No? Zoom? It's easy. Just leave the P out. P silent. Anybody? Sitakai. Cestacea. Cestacea. That's where we're going to go. All right. Chlamydia pneumonia. Chlamydia philia. So we have chlamydia by itself with trachomatis, phila, phila with cestacea and pneumonia. Infected cells are characterized by intracytoplasmic inclusions. So if you see these cells, that's the way we're going to detect it. It's going to be in the cell. So it's not going to be something that is outside. So we're going to look for these inclusions. The trachomatis produces a compact inclusion. You can stain it with iodine. So we see, you know, when you start seeing these names like intracellular parasite and iodine, you're getting real excited, I know, because that's parasitology next spring. Those things kind of go together when we start talking parasitology in the spring. Uh, they are sulfur drug susceptible. So we, you may have heard about sulfur drug back in the day. Uh, and we're going to hit that next week with our antibiotics. They are susceptible to sulfa, sulfa drugs. The chlamydiophilia cystache, cystacea, cystache, we're changing it yet? Inclusions are diffuse. They do not stain with iodine and they're resistant to the sulfa drug. So we're going to put those in, in a kind of a chart form if you were doing this at home. And then pneumonia produces a compact inclusion, just like chlamydia does, I mean, trachomatis does. It does not stain with iodine again. So the, the big key here is chlamydia philia does not stain with iodine, but it's, and they're both resistant to sulfur where the other is susceptible. So that's our compare and contrast of our chlamydias. So here's a picture of the inclusions, intracellular inclusion, that dark staining iodine, big monocytic, lymphocytic look to it, all right? Which kind of cell is that? Um, probably an epith, I don't know. I don't, is it a blood cell or is it epithelial cell? It, it almost looks like blood cells to me. Yeah. But I see, uh, could be. It looks like usually what you do here is scraping. So I'm thinking that's epithelial. So I don't think it's blood, but a great question. But it looks like to me, these are epithelial. These are the nucleuses in the epithelial, almost like a, a columnar epithelial. And we'll do this, you know, this can attack the eye. All right, the cornea of the eye, we'd scrape that. And also um, other skin areas, so we can see that. So there it is up closer. Here's the inclusion. This is the, that's the nucleus of the cell. I'm pretty sure this is the outer border of the cells. It almost looks like skin cells. Okay, so chlamydia have a unique form of replication. It's unlike any other microorganisms because they have kind of a, almost like a parasite, they kind of have a life cycle. 
but they're not parasites, not in the same idea of a parasite. So they're parasitic, but they're bacteria. Keep that straight. The infectious form, what we see is this unique infectious form called elementary body, EB, which is actively taken into the host cell by phagocytosis. So we may have blood cells, right? During the next six to eight hours, the elementary bodies undergo a reorganization into reticulate body, RBs, instead of EBs. And these are non-infectious, but they're very active metabolistic. So for 18 to 24 hours, the retic body synthesizes new material and divides binary fission. The retic body then reorganizes into what is known as the elementary body. So it kind of starts as an elementary body when it's phagocytized. Then it turns into retic bodies. And then it goes back to elementary bodies. The cell lysis, and once the cell lysis, the elementary bodies then are free to find other cells to be infected. It's very fragile though once it gets outside the cell. Remember, it's an obligate intracellular parasite. So it only survives for a couple of days if it's at 37 degrees. If it's even if it goes cooler than that, right? They're they just they're ineffective. We can preserve them at minus 70. Chlamydia are inactivated by ether and ethanol. You give it 30 minutes by formalin and phenol if you give it 24 hours. So here's that replication cycle. So we do have a question. I think, we're, I think Lauren, you're gonna look this up for me since you brought it up. To see which uh, cell which it is? Cells, which cells are more likely to be infected with chlamydia trachomatis? I think that's a good question. It's a great question. What chapter are we on? Maybe the book can help us too. Uh, 43. 43, thank you. Which chlamydia is it? The truck, the truck one? Tra yeah, trachomatis, we'll start there. It says epithelial cells of the urogenital tract in conjunction. Okay. Those aren't really phagocytic though, are they? So no. it's going to be our immune response. When you think? So these elementary bodies that are out, they're outside the cell where they were there to live, right? So it kind of makes it sound like what? We have the life cycle depends on the phagocytic cells, but the infectivity is any cell, right? Does that make sense? Is the book helping? Is anybody following with this on the book? It doesn't really say much about the cells. It just keeps saying the mainly females in the urogenital tract. Okay, cultivation. Culture. It says it can infect a variety of different cells, including epithelial of the mucosal and blood valves or vessels, smooth muscle cells, and monocytes. Mm, okay. So yeah, I think it's a great. I think that was a great pause in the action. I think now we have a better understanding that yeah, they're in the epithelial. They're also in the phagocyte, phagocytes, and phagocytes. Okay, this. Is this life cycle. And this is going to sound so familiar. When we get to this next semester, you're going to see every one of our parasites has a life cycle. But it's not inside one host, it's like moving from host to other host. All right, so how do we collect for this, right? We talked about swabbing, right? Doing a um, vaginal swab for gonorrhea and chlamydia is done. Uh, Scrapings, so like pap smear is a good way. You see that quite often diagnosed. And where's, where's that? How? Who's, who does my, is there somebody in here that does? Who works at PAP? Somebody work at PAP? Kathy. Yeah, 
Kathy's here. All right. So path, you do deal with pap smears. You ever hear them talking about chlamydia being detected off pap smear? I don't think we test for that. Like if we do, they, it was, it's mostly like, um, Gonorrhea, HPV, something more than HPV. No, they never say the fancy word. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I just know that a lot of I mean, patients get diagnosed that way. Like they, because I, it's very serious with females because it causes scarring and moves and causes infertility. Yeah, I just do most of the grunt work, so okay. I'm going to get tested all that. <laughs> well, I knew somebody was here that could help me with the pap smear. Trachoma. Trachoma. This is a, a con conjugal scraping or swab. So this is coming from the eye. So trachoma is where we get this uh, infection of the eye. The cysticosis is pneumonia with sputum, throat, and pleural. And then we get down to the cerv cervicitis and the urethritis urethral, cervical, and rectal swabbings or scraping. The, we have, I know that you love the pictures that are coming, but we have a lymphogranuloma venereum too. Uh, lymph node aspirate, but we will see what that looks like some later too. But, um, so again, we have to have the cells. We want the cells, the scrapings, scrapings, you know, pick up those skin cells so we can see these inclusions because that's where they are, they're inside the cells. Um, so we want the epithelial cells, not the discharge. So must be collected since they're obligate intracellular parasites. So therefore scrapings are preferred. So when we think about a vaginal swab, usually there is discharge and they'll do the GC, uh, you know, the gonorrhea and the chlamydia swab. And we hope they get some skin swab, you know, and just don't go in and pick up the discharge, which you would think gonorrhea would be present in. ASAP um, inoculated. We do <coughs> direct examination since it's a cell, right? We had the iodine where we could do direct stain. And so until recently, eye scrapings were stained with gizma stain. Uh, to demonstrate the presence of the inclusions, but presently we do a DFA technique used to examine genital, rectal, and the conjunctival specimens. So here's the DFA, of course, pick up, you know, big light up here, fluorescence with the inclusion. See that pretty easy. Looks like one of the planets, right? Would you say that? Just all of a sudden, woo, I didn't know we were going to be talking about. What are we thinking? Mercury? The one with Mercury there? Mercury usually come across as this color picture? No? No? No for Mercury here? Looks like Jupiter. Jupiter? No. Well, yeah, the Jupiter has the big. Is it Jupiter that has the big yeah. thing? Okay. <laughs> Cell cultures are used to cultivate organism. So cultivating the organism, we want cell cultures because this is going to stay in the cell. It's going to replicate in the cell. Infected cells are detected by staining the cell layer and looking for the inclusion. So let's take a look at chlamydia trachomatis. We're going to start here, so don't be confused. Don't just you know, when you're going through this, all of a sudden, hey, he's been talking about this sexually transmitted, and then all of a sudden, boom, we're back to the trachoma, right? The trachoma, remember, trachoma is where? In the eye, okay? So it's the world's most uh, important because it causes blindness. It's the most important cause of blindness in the world. There's mainly poor underdeveloped countries, Middle East, North Africa, North India, Native Americans in the Southwest US. But gosh, you know, Eastern part of Arkansas, we have no poor, right? Isn't that true? That's right, there's no poor people in East Arkansas, is there? Huh? That the point is, you don't know 
who may be exposed, right? Okay, so yeah, just because I say underdeveloped countries, and then we end up in Native American land in the Southwest US on, you know, the reservations, all right? It could be right here in this city. You just don't know, right? Just don't know. So don't be submissive sometimes when we throw these like descriptions out and you think that's somewhere else. Transmission, person to person, not sexually transmitted, okay? So chlamydia trachomatis causing the trachoma, causing blindness is not a sexually transmitted illness. Here's the distribution. Here's our picture inside the eyelid. Okay. Uh. Can they not just cut that out? Can you not cut that out? You could treat it, sure. Yeah, these are untreated. Yeah, it is treatable. And we're gonna see about that in just a minute because you were treated when you were born, maybe, probably. Um, yes, it's treatable, but can it be cut out? Not before it's already caused blindness. Okay, so it's scarring. Could they do a transplant, cornea transplant? I don't know. I'm not up on my eye doctoring today. All right, so we go back for a history lesson. You know how I love history. I like to share Mr. Payne's history lessons that he gave us. The immigration law of 1891. I was not around in 1891. U.S. Public Health Services responsible for inspection of all immigrants coming to the United States, right? Public health physicians performed examinations and they were concerned about cholera, scalp and nail fungus, insanity, and mental impairments, among other things. In 1907, legislation was passed to bar entry of immigrants suffering from tuberculosis, epilepsy, and physical disability. Most cases of exclusion were the result of examinations for trachoma, a highly contagious eye infection. A little day in history for you there in 1907. And y'all missed my political rant yesterday. 1907, <laughs> we're Still excluding immigrants somehow, some way, since we've started it, it just, okay, enough on that. The flies can transmit foodborne illnesses, uh, diseases such as cholera, typhoid, paratyphoid, salmonellosis, and dysentery, as well as my, my, myasis, trachoma, and y'alls. So trachoma is a fly, can be transmitted by flies. They breed on organic waste, Ref, refuse and animal excrement. So I'm sure, I don't know if you've seen pictures like this and late night TV, um, dirty faces, flies cause trachoma, fight trachoma, wash your face. This is in Sudan, okay? You know, you can imagine the fly in an eye going and getting on another eye and transmitting um, possibly the organism Okay, so trachomatous, not trachoma, trachomatous is a non-gonococcal NGC, post-gonococcal PCG, urethitis, or cervi cervicitis. These are sexually transmitted. Okay, so trachomatous is sexually transmitted. Have replaced gonorrhea is the most common STD. If it's untreated, disease can lead to PID, epididymitis, infertility and potentially fatal tubal pregnancies. So definitely a problem with females, okay? So that's why we wanna make sure we're screening, make sure there's no infection, make sure we get skin scrapings when we go in to get the samples. Cervical erosion. So if we have that, if we have a, a mom pregnant, future mom pregnant, 
getting ready to give birth and she is infected with trachomatis, we can have a problem. So as the newborn comes through the birth canal, the adult transmits to the, from the genitalia to the eye of the newborn. Non-trachoma infections can be severe. Okay, so that is not just the eye, but inhaling, getting it inside the body. Conjunctivitis. Y'all probably won't look at pink eye ever the same, even though pink eye is caused by a different organism, right? Anybody remember the pink eye organism? Isn't it arginosa? No. Hmm? Isn't it like Pseudomonas arginosa or something? Pseudomonas arginosa? It might not be. For pink eye? It starts with an A though. Egyptius. That. Yeah, that. <laughs> You're close. If you got Arge, Egypt. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> okay, you do know we're having a comprehensive final, right, this semester? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't, don't be so quick to flush things. Uh, Trachomatis. Clinical significance, lymphogranuloma venereum, which is uncommon in the US, begins as a small painless vesicular or ulcerative lesion, which heals spontaneously. Huh? Two to six weeks later, symptoms of chills, fever, and lymphadenopathy occur. Swollen, painful lymph nodes are experienced by the patient. Has a similar ring, right? Does it have a similar, uh, Similar ring to it. I think that's what I want to say. What's the similar ring there of a lesion healing spontaneously without treatment? Six. Six. Good. We just did that yesterday. So again, lymphogranuloma venereum. Hominiophilia cestacea. And where we're going? I like that. Uh, these are animal infections. So they naturally infect birds. But I don't know if any of you know anybody that loves parrots and have a couple of them at their house. But psittacosis is a problem with parrots. So your parrot probably had to be screened for chlamydia cestacea before it came out of the pet store, or when it was got to the pet store. So these, these are usually, if you have a pet store dealing, it's usually okay, I won't say 100%, but if you had somebody that had a parrot, didn't like the parrot, and didn't want to have it anymore, and wanted to give it to you, can't always guarantee that. But I do know from, I've had friends that have, or a, I'll say friend, a friend that loved parrots, and this was one of the one thing they made sure they, they had this under control, right? It's acquired from parrots. The human infectious ranges from an asymptomatic to a fatal pneumonia. But in most cases associated with mild to moderate symptoms of atypical pneumonia, kind of like our walking pneumonia, fever, non-productive cough, fatigue, chills, and headache. Or chlamydiophilia cestacea. Chlamydiophilia pneumonia this is transferred person to person. The disease is pneumonia in the elderly, bronchitis, pharyngitis, sinusitis, flu-like illness. The uh, pneumonia infection has been linked to atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, and coronary heart disease. So definitely one uh, we do not prefer. Diagnosis, cell culture, or serology. How many have heard of chlamydiophilia pneumonia before today? Anybody ever heard of that? C pneumonia? Okay. Questions there? We're, we're switching gears. We're switching gears now. We've gotten, uh, we started with who? Who did we start with today? Mycoplasma. Mycoplasma pneumonia. And then we had chlamydiophilia pneumonia with trachomatis and trachoma. And now we're moving into rickettsia. When you hear rickettsia, what do you think? Ticks, right. We have a background of a tick, right? So this is our tick. We have rickettsiaceae, anaplasmia, tacea, and 
Martinella, Martinelliaceae families. We've got three we're going to talk about today. These are obligate intracellular parasites in the same vein as we've had so far, right? But these um, are going to have a tick vector involved or a flea or lice. So, do y'all remember coming? Do y'all ever come tour the lab when you were like trying to figure out if this is going to be your major or not? I've asked you this already. Y'all remember like looking at the microscopes and seeing a flea and a tick and a body louse? Okay, just see. That's why I think about this lecture. So we have Rickettsias. This is their family. So we got Rickettsia Rickettsi. We got Rickettsia acara. We got Rickettsia. Uh, Prowaziki, we got Rickettsia typhi, Orientia uh, Sutsugamushi. How'd that do? Is that all right, or did I just butcher that? Sutsugamushi, Coxiella Bernetti. That's a good one to say. I love the Bernetti. I like that. Uh, Anapla uh, Anaplasmacea family, this is our second group. Uh, this is where the Ericlia are, Ericlia uh, chafians, chafinus, chafi, or chaffy, I think it's chaffy. And anybody from Northwest Arkansas that I've already asked this? Anybody from Northwest Arkansas? Yeah. You know what we're talking about there? Okay. We'll get to that. Or chaffy. Uh, Erylichia, um, we're going to go with Ewing, 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 I, who wants to help me? Somebody help me with these. Y'all are not helping me with these words. I really got to have help next semester. This is parasitology. And this just, this is already getting me worried. We going with Ewing there? Sure. Ewing, Ewing, I. How's double I go? E-I. E-I? Yeah. Ewing E-I? Sure. Sure. Okay. Ewing E. Anaplasma. Ana, anaplasma. Is that right? Anaplasma phagocytophyllum. Cytophyllum. Phagocytum. Phagocytophyllum. <laughs> okay. And these are all recorded for your listening pleasure later, right? <laughs> Neo Rickettsia. Um, Sanetsu? Sanetsu? Yeah. Sanetsu. Okay, all right. And then we get to uh, Bardanella Aishia family, Bardanella Quintana, trench fever, Bardanelli Hensley, cat, cat, cat scratch disease, cat, cat scratch fever, and Bardanelli Bacilliformis, Borea fever, all right? Oro, Oroya. Oroya, Oroya fever. Okay, all right. I'm, okay, I think if we had like a video, like like one thing we could do, could you do a TikTok with this? <laughs> Is like have each one of you like show up and like say one of these and then like TikTok to the next. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? That would be fun. It might be a lab this semester. It might be our final. Who knows? All right, Rickettsia, Rickettsia, we, we do know these. We, we've heard of some of these, so we'll get to some of these Rickettsias. Classification, obligate intracellular parasite. Rickettsia are hard to visualize because they stain poorly. So I know I said somebody could bring me a tick and we'd open it up and we'd try to stain the guts and see if we could find anything. Uh, very small, they lack contrast, uh, with the exception of Coxiella bernetti. They appear to be gram negative and visualization is better if we use gizmo stain. Uh, reservoirs, all but two of these species parasitize animals, and man, believe it or not, is an incidental host to the Rickettsias. So we have arthropod vectors, with one exception. Except for the species of Coxiella bernetti, these organisms are fragile when exposed to conditions outside the body. And then we have symptoms of fever, headache, Malaysia, Malaysia, and rash. So we see that. And we diagnose these with immunofluorescent assays and enzyme immunoassays. Bernetti has no rash. So 
So here we finally got to a name y'all can recall, hopefully. Rocky Mountain Spotted. It is here. It's southeast or southwest United States, more often in the Rocky Mountain states, but it's here too. So that is, you know, we'll, we'll see it again uh, out and about when everybody gets out in March. Primarily disease of children. Uh, you know, the ones I've seen are adults. So uh, vectors, uh, derma center species. The wood tick, Andersoni, okay. In the Rocky Mountain states, the dog tick in the Eastern United States. So I think somebody's gonna bring me a dog tick, all right, because it on dog. So we would hopefully it'd be the uh, variabilious tick. Uh, the, re the agent inside the tick is Rickettsia rickettsi. So this is the rickettsial organism that we'll see. Here is the uh, Thermocenter Andersoni wood tick. Anybody like ticks? Me either. Good. Variabilius dog tick. And you're thinking he's not going to ask us tick questions. Yes, he will. Okay. So when I throw up an Andersoni, and a variabilius, you need to associate that with Rocky Mountain spotted and rickettsia rickettsia. Okay. Uh, we also have an Ambuloma uh, maculatum lone star tick, and it gets its name because it has a lone white dot on the back. We'll see him in just a minute. Here's our spotted fever rash. So the rickettsial pox, mild non-fatal disease endemic to the Eastern United States and Russia. So we're switching gear. So we had our rickettsia rickettsi for Rocky Mountain Spotted. Now we're going to what is known as rickettsial pox. And the etiological agent here is Akari. And the vector is mouse mites. Okay, so a mite that likes to be on a mouse, okay. Transmission is that mite gets off of you and bites you. Okay, so that's how we get it out of the mouse and onto us. So it's a bite. All right, so we have another rickettsial is epidemic typhus and Braille Zinzer disease. Etiological agent is rickettsia prowaski. The vector is the human body louse. The organism is passed in the feces and affects wounds through scratching. So, anybody had a body louse? Don't raise your hand, just think about it. One of the things I've seen is itching and scratching. So you can imagine how easy that would be to infect the feces into a wound through scratching. Humans are the primary reservoir, but it has been isolated. Those that have flying squirrels as pets. Anybody have a flying squirrel? You can raise your hand on this one because I want to see if anybody has a flying squirrel. Or is it the flying squirrel? What's the other? There's a little squirrel, right? That you can make a pet out of, put it in a little cage at your house. Is it, I don't think it call I don't think they call it a flying squirrel, but they do fly. Does anybody know what little squirrel I'm talking about? I know it's about the pumpkin thing. The what? Which one? used to call them pocket pets. Yeah, they're about the size of fit the pocket. I used to know the name of it, but I don't know. Don't know? They would sell them in the mall. Yeah. <laughs> but they're yeah. like expensive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they, yeah. Anybody? Nobody? Bryal Zinzer disease, a recurrence of previous typhus, milder form occurs years later after the infection. So here's our body louse, pediculus, humanus, body louse. Yeah. All right, so we have another rickettsia. This is our murine typhus, and that would be what? When we hear murine, we think 
I think mouse. Do you think mouse? Do you think rat? What do you think? Is that a good name or marine? What does marine stand for? M U R I N E. Marine. Relating to or affecting mice or related rodents. Rodent, right. So that's where we get. We get we see this with what? We did our antibodies with that too, right? Didn't we get some urine antibody before? Yes, the rat, even though it's marine referring to a mouse, we do the rat flea, the flea bite with feces from an infected flea, contaminates the host mucosal membrane, and we end up with rickettsia typhi. There's the rat flea. Q fever, another one of the rickettsias. Etiological agent is Coxiella burnetti. Transmission is inhalation. Unlike other rickettsial disease, there is no rash and no arthropod vector. So this is the exception. The disease is pneumonitis, respiratory disease, Q fever, Coxiella burnetti, no vector, inhalation, pneumonia, Q fever. <clears throat> here up on your x-rays, you know B is whitening out down here with pneumonia in the right lower quadrant lobe. Scrub typhus, orienta, orientia, su, uh, what are we going to go with? Satsugama mushi. Is that it? Gamushi? Y'all aren't going to forget that one, are you? Chiggers. Chigger bite. Not the adult. The larvae. Reservoir, rodents, and birds. Scrub typhus. There's our chigger. Adult chigger versus a larval chigger. Trench fever, Bardinelli Quintana. Vector is a human body louse again, pediculus humanus humanus. Feces of that louse contaminated into the bite of, on the human. And we have another Bardinelli Hensel, Hensela? In Sally, help, help me again. Hensel, Hensel A, Hensel, Hensel A. Bardinelli Hensel A is now recognized as the causative agent of cat scratch disease. Wonder how we get that. Nobody knows. No, nobody knows how you get cat scratch disease. Yes, your cat scratches you, yeah, and, and that introduces it, all right. Anaplasmacea family, four species that cause disease in humans. And this is where we get to um, one of our Arkansas uh, Ericleus, Ericlea chaffinus. 1986, it was identified at Fort Chaffee in Fort Smith. Cause is... What's that? I thought you were joking. Oh, you thought I was joking? No. <laughs> no, it, it, it's got a history. 1986 ID at Fort Chaffee. It's a cause of human monocytic auriculosis, HME, mortality rate 2 to 5%. And this is where we bring up our Lone Star tick and the American dog tick. So we got our variabilis and our Americanum. We have a Ericlea a wingy. A wingy is it I -E? how do you say double I again? I wingy. Anybody who has I I at the end of their name? Anybody? Y'all y'all got your heads down now. It is another agent of human auriculosis. So usually when you get a tick bite order, I think I said this the other day, when the doctor says, Hey, I need a tick bite profile. 
Ericulosis is one of them, okay? One of them in the group. Lyme is the other one, and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is the third. Okay, so we usually do a three, screen the serum for three antibodies to these three uh, tick bite organisms. So it is the Amboloma americanum, and that too, who is that again? Otherwise known as the dog, no, Lone Star, Lone Star tick. And there he is, the Amboloma americanum, Lone Star tick with the Lone Star right there on the back. Here's our engorged Americana, right? So that's him normal. It's him once he's been on a, somebody for a while, probably a animal looking at the hair. Anaplasmacea, modiacea, anaplasma, phagocytophilia, 1993. This is the human granulocytic anaplasmosis. HGA, formerly called human granulocytic auriculosis, HGE, getting up in mortality rate now to 7 to 10%. And this is Ixota scapularis, our black leg tick that we've already seen before, and our dermocentral variabilis, our dog tick. Neo rickettsia senetsu, agent of mononucleosis like illness found in Japan and Malaysia. So here's the rickolosis. So this is kind of the condition, right? This is what is caused by the auriculias that we've been talking about. Highest incidence southeast and south central areas of the United States, we are in this ballpark. So we're players in this one. Symptoms are similar to Rocky Mountain Spotted. Takes one to two weeks, one to three weeks after the bite. We end up with a high fever, headache, malaise, myalgia, rash observed on 10, only in 10% of the cases. So not like Rocky Mountain. Pathology, the organism parasitizes the macrophage or the granulocytes leading to a leukopenia and a thrombocytopenia. You are familiar with those terms. We diagnose it with serological testing, immunofluorescent assay. We look for a fourfold rise in the antibody. And then what's key to auriculosis is what's known as a morula. Okay, so inside the cell, the cytoplasmic vacuoles in which auriculia species grow look like a morula. Okay, which is just a, like a seed pod. I don't know if you've ever seen a morula, but it's got all these little like pod looking things. So it's seen in the peripheral granulocytes, but not the monocyte. Prognosis is always good and probably gonna leave the ER if you went to the ER with this fever with us, if you even mentioned you might have pulled a tick off maybe sometime in the last couple of weeks, doxycycline is the only drug which has been proven to be effective. And what we're going to talk a little bit about doxy next week is it inhibits protein synthesis by binding to the 30S ribosomal subunit. So it keeps that translation of the RNA from happening to form protein. So this morula, okay, it looks like a seed pod inside the uh, phagocyte cell. All right, questions. I think we got time. We can pull up a morula. Close that out. We'll stop the share. Sorry. I think I did anyway. I got the chat. All right. So you want to, let's see if we can pull up a morula right quick, see if we can find this shape. Yeah, 
Here it comes, maybe. All right. I really wasn't looking for it in the cell. That's kind of it right here. Just like seeds right here. Yeah, it, it looks it looks like it's here it is. This is more auriculosis. But I was trying to find like where it got its name, like what was the actual shape of a morla, a mortar. I don't know if I can find that or not. Alright, anyway, we might find it downstairs for lab. No questions? We'll go ahead and end the meeting and we'll see you downstairs for micro.